This is Photographing the West Podcast, the podcast for people who love to explore the western highways and byways while photographing the landscape and wildlife. And now here's your host, Kirby Flanagan. Hello and welcome to episode 48 of the Photographing the West Podcast brought to you by Flanagan Photos. Twice a month, we bring you interesting interviews with interesting people. Some are photographers and some are not. All lead interesting lives in the natural world. My guest today is author, researcher, mammologist, and photographer, Dr. Jim Halfpenny. Welcome to Photographing the West, Jim. Well, thank you for having me on, Kirby. It's my pleasure. I'm glad it finally worked out. So to start off, uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself as a person, an author, a researcher, photographer, all those things you do in your busy life. Well, I've been fortunate to spend all of my life working in the natural and outdoor environments. Uh, This was my 51st season of polar bear, uh, I'm sorry, 51st season of polar exploration. I started, turned 21 in Antarctica. And this year, 51 seasons with our high Arctic programs. Uh, We are based at the Northgate to Yellowstone, and uh, carnivores are a great interest of our organization, but so is tracking animals by their footprints. And we run a lot of programs in Yellowstone, but a lot of programs the high Arctic. I'll be leaving in about 10 days for my 29th season of polar bear uh, educational classes and photography. And I get out in Yellowstone on literally a daily basis. I only got to walk 200 yards to get into the park. And of course, the camera's always in the shirt pocket, now my little one, and get lots of good opportunities here. Back to you. Yeah, that's uh, hard to beat your location for uh, wildlife. Uh, So... uh, the Arctic expeditions or travels, are those uh, an organized thing or are things you do on your own or how, how does that come about? Well, I run a company called Naturalist World based in Gardner, Montana, and we run five polar expeditions a year. One is up the west coast of Greenland across the Northwest Passage. One is living in Greenland and Iceland. One is um, uh, polar bears in northern Canada, and then one is Aurora Photography. And for that Aurora Photography, if you go to Google+, Plus, if you look up Aurora Borealis Photography, you will see our uh, community page on photographing the Aurora. So these are all expeditions our company runs, but we work in conjunction with other companies because running this sort of expedition is very expensive and we do some of the work on icebreakers. And so there'll be six to eight of us in a given collaboration for a single trip. I see. So the polar bears, are you going to Churchill or? We work at Churchill, but this is not the tourist Churchill you might be thinking of. Uh, We live at a research station 25 miles east from Churchill. And out there we have researchers on all sorts of topics, including bears. And then um, I actually have workbooks. This is a full-blown class, lectures every night, daylight hours, we're out looking for bears, but we do the uh, local stuff. The class is about the ecosystem of the bear. And I want people to know everything that the bear encounters uh, from its natural environment, clear through to the presence of and impact of the European people on the environment. We look at the historical stuff, the Indians, the Inuit, uh, dog sledding, museums, a little bit of everything. Wow, that sounds really interesting. So uh, you're also uh, very interested in uh, grizzly bears and black bears in addition to the polar bears. So uh, talk about that a bit. My first love would be bears. No question on that. And over the years uh, with our programs, I've worked everywhere in North America. There are different kinds of bears. Uh, red black bears, black black bears, white black bears called spirit or commode bears, coastal browns, Kodiak browns, uh, polar bears, uh, interior grizzlies, all the different kind of bears on the ground. We're on the ground with bears from February through November each year. And um, 
Oh, it's just my first love. What can I say, Kirby? And I like carnivores next, but uh, bears are the first love. Yeah, that's understandable. That uh, probably would be true for me as well. I spent some time in Alaska and uh, got a chance to see bears up close and uh, fell in love with them and uh, subsequently with uh, the uh, grizzly bears in Yellowstone. So, yeah, I understand that. So, uh, in addition to the wool, or in addition to the bears, I should say, uh, you're also uh, well known for your interest in wolves. Uh, how did all that start, and uh, what are you doing with those these days? Well, my interest is carnivores, and it all started in the library when I was probably seven, eight, nine years old, Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. I read every natural history book but in particular, the books of Ernest Thompson Seton on tracking by footprints. And by the time I was 14, I was being paid by hunters to find animals they had wounded and couldn't find. And I've been involved in tracking ever since. We run the largest wildlife forensic tracking organization in the world. If you go to um, trackscenainvestigation.com, you'll find our legal forensic website. We handle about a case every other week dealing with the signs of animals and they're used to solve uh, crimes and mysteries. And because of that, I fell in love with everything that had big canine teeth, that'd be bears, wolves, but through the years I've been fortunate enough to work with Wolverine, Lynx, Fisher, Martin, Cougars, Bobcats, whatever's rare. And I travel North America primarily, teaching people how to find rare animals by their signs. And this is a professional level uh, tracking at the legal aspect of natural history. And we run the largest wildlife forensic tracking museum in the world, sitting right here on the edge of Yellowstone. Well, with all that behind me, uh, and back when I knew Yellowstone didn't have wolves, I became involved with testifying at hearings to bring wolves in. And as the wolves come in, I've had small parts um, with the whole wolf reintroduction and all the way through since we brought wolves to Yellowstone National Park. So uh, continuing that thought, uh, how has that progressed and how are the wolves doing these days? Well, one of my key projects, uh, at the very beginning, I knew these were the people's wolves and they wanted to know about them. When they got to Yellowstone, they wanted to know about them. So I started developing a front and back color chart each year that had all the wolves and the packs and each pack was color coded. If a wolf left a pack, its color background color went with it to the new pack and so you could follow the genealogy. And I kept track of every single wolf through 2005. Then the population got too big and there were too many agencies, state, federal and tribal involved. So I started concentrating only on the wolves at Yellowstone and have kept it up clear through. Each year I sell about 4,000 charts People get a chart, they come here, they can see the pack composition, turn on the back and see a picture of the key wolves and a map that shows them where to look in Yellowstone. Well, people got real interested. So I did a book that summarized charts in 2012, but the interest, people love their wolves. So I struck a deal up between two and three years ago with ancestry.com to put all of the wolf genealogy information on there. Well, when I looked at it, We've had well over 2,000 wolves in a single wolf. There might be 10 different pieces of information about that wolf. And it was just too big of a task. So I went to Kickstarter and I raised $25,000 and hired a staff. And we worked with Ancestry and we put the whole genealogy of wolves on Ancestry.com. So now you can go in and find your favorite wolf, read its life history story. You can create a poster, a book through Ancestry of your wolf, your pack, whatever you're interested in. Schools use this to study. And um, the key element is you have to have permission to get into Ancestry. And so what you have to do is go to our website called Wolf Genes. That's W-O-L-F-G-E-N-E-S dot info dot info. And there you request your invitation. We send it to you. And then you have access to this incredible history of the wolves on Ancestry. Now, let me give you a little bit of a fun story on this. Um, 
ancestry was made for humans. And when we started entering the data in there, ancestry just didn't understand a two-year-old girl having six babies from a three-year-old boy. <laughs> so we had to devise uh, workarounds to get this in there. Well, since we did this, now the um, um, killer whale people and the fin, no, let's see, it's humpback whale people have called us and contacted us and say, well, how do we do this? And I'm not up to date if they've got anything on Ancestry yet or not. But that's the wolf story. And I've done all sorts of uh, research projects on the wolves here in the park, too. Well, you are a busy guy. How do you keep, how are you able to juggle all these balls that you have in the air? Well, it's a full time game, 16 hours a day, most of the days. And my wife worked with me on many of the programs we've done. Uh, and there's a lot of folks with interests that help out here in the Yellowstone area. Yeah, Yellowstone uh, has a, uh, what's the right word, uh, a very intense and loving uh, following amongst a lot of people, both uh, in the U.S. and overseas, I think. Yes, it's certainly magic, and it draws its crowd of uh, defenders who are personally uh, involved and feel a passion about it, and that is a worldwide basis. At our education center here, we have people coming in. I've got an Austrian group here right now for two weeks. They're working on research on ravens and wolves. I have uh, British, French, German, Japanese groups on a fairly frequent basis. Of course, lots of Canadians, they love to come down and uh, be part of what's going on. Yeah, it's that's uh, pretty awesome. Uh, while we're talking about wolves and bears, uh, being a photographer, I'm interested in knowing uh, what's the best way to photograph both bears and wolves without uh, interfering with their lives and without endangering your life. Well, time is the key answer. People get to see these you know, in your face, fantastic photos of a grizzly or wolf, and they arrive here and they want to do the same thing, but they don't realize that the good natural history photographer learns his natural history, comes here and spends days, weeks, even months to get that one photo that they show. It's not just that you walk in and get that photograph. Uh, good photographers do their homework and do their work time here, and it takes a long time. Uh, most of the time, wolves like to stay out there a half mile or so, and you're just waiting for the time that they get close enough that a real good lens does a job for you. And what that means when you're in Yellowstone, whether you're looking for bears or wolves, we're out there before daylight, and we work to after daylight from can't see in the morning to can't see at night, uh, hoping to get a photograph. And in my bear class, which I teach in June, you know, in four days, I'll probably have 20 to 30 grizzlies for my students, but most of those are quite a distance out. And if we're lucky, we get some that are close in four days. So the elements are time, dedication, and work. And when you're out there, uh, 365 days a year, we have a cadre of uh, people who are interested in wildlife, particularly wolves. And they're out there from can't see to can't see, and they know how to look, where to look. So one of the key elements of finding animals is driving the roads and looking for other observers and learning to judge their level of excitement. Are they on something good? Uh, you don't get good pictures by going hiking somewhere. Uh, wolves move 20 miles in a day, and by hiking, you would be just lucky to cross the paths. Bears can move great distances. So as much as I hate to involve the modern mechanical thing, the best way to find these animals is to drive by wolves and put your time, drive by vehicle, I'm sorry, and put your time in looking. Then, of course, have good equipment. Uh, good telephotos help out. The good naturalist, the good photographer, is very respectful of the animal, keeps the distance, but you do have to carry bear spray because it's always possible to accidentally bump into something you weren't counting on. And beforehand, you should also learn all the safety behavior of dealing bears and wolves. Actually, the most dangerous animal here is the bison. Uh, so you need to do your safety homework also and have decided ahead of time how you will behave 
in those close encounter situations that might pop up. Good advice. Yeah, I always say the uh, most dangerous animal in uh, Yellowstone is uh, man, because uh, they're usually driving around looking at the wildlife and uh, not looking where they're going. But uh, but the bison, uh, yeah, they definitely uh, are, are underrated for their uh, ability to both charge you and throw you in the air, I think. Yeah, we've had as many as 15 bison gorings in a single year. There wow. were at least a couple this year that I'm aware of. Um, so, yeah, one keeps an eye on the bison. Uh, if I ever get hurt, it's probably not going to be a wild animal. It's going to be some vehicle. Uh, they scare me more than the animals. <laughs> yeah, very true. So going back to the wolves, uh, talk about uh, what's happened uh to the ecology of Yellowstone as a result of the introduction of wolves? Well, wolves were gone for around seven decades from the ecosystem, and it was at a new balance level. And now the wolves are shifting that balance level with direct effects, for instance, um, in Lamar Valley, one of the major areas of Yellowstone. We had 13 coyote packs prior to the introduction. And where the wolves set up their den, they killed off a couple of coyote packs. So that down, dropped down to 11. And wolves and coyotes compete, and wolves will kill coyotes. And so the average population dropped from about uh, 70 down to about 50 on coyotes uh, in packs in the valleys. So there was a direct impact like that. Um, they had a direct impact on the number of elk, particularly killing off more older and sick ones. But by killing off elk that reduced the grazing and browsing pressure on plants, um, in particular browsing on aspen, uh, conifers, and cottonwood. And so areas particularly close to the den, we've seen a dramatic increase in these plants, which allows animals that like the aspen to benefit, such as the warblers, um, beautiful songbirds, and the moose. Uh, we've also, though, had climate change going on at the same time, which has helped the um, aspen and cottonwoods. So you can't, it's not easy to separate out the effects. Some people like say, oh, the wolves did all this. Well, the truth is the wolves did not do all this. We see more impact near the den sites, farther away you go. More climate is the important factor, uh, climate infecting soil moisture and moisture. So they've changed the ecosystem. There's no question on that. Uh, cougars now have to kill more because the wolves uh, often drive a cougar off the carcass when it's got it. Um, a lot of interactions between all the large carnivores, but it goes clear down to the small ones, uh, you know, killing a coyote. Uh, we have instances of wolves killing badgers, for example. So that's a new predator the badger didn't worry about for seven decades. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that uh, wolves are able to drive off a cougar, for example, uh, let alone the coyotes. But uh, they well, when, uh, go ahead. When you've got a pack of wolves, as solitary cougars have great disadvantage. Sure. And we know the wolves have killed uh, at least four cougars, but cougars have also killed wolves. Um, uh, one instant cougar took on two wolves killed one and ran the other one off. And so the score, uh, it goes both ways. Both animals kill each other, depending on who happens to have the advantage. Most of the time the advantage goes to wolf because it's a pack animal. Are these killings occurring as uh, fights over uh, another kill, uh, an elk or whatever? Probably most encounters are at uh, sites where elk or a bison, something like that has been killed. But occasionally these occur as just surprise encounters in the woods. Wolf walking along just encounters the cougar and run it up a tree. One of my favorite events uh, early on, we found a carcass one morning and realized there was a cougar on it. And we sat there for about an hour and a half watching it. Then the cougar looked up the hill and uh, it had been eaten, but it looked up the hill and here came three wolves. And the wolves come down and they start chase the cougar. As the cougar's running along, three coyotes change it, chase the cougar. 
So I've got video showing three coyotes and three wolves side by side going after the cougar, which got to the lowest tree on tree line and went up and escaped. Well, that all goes to prove that um, the mutual hatred of canids, wolves and coyotes, exceeds the territorial imperative of territoriality between wolves and coyotes. Well, at least with an example of one. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard or seen that anywhere. It's interesting to me that there seemed to be more, uh, at least uh, my last trip there in uh, uh, May and June, there seemed to be more moose about than there have been going back a few years, uh, especially up there in the northeast corner. So is that uh, part of what's going on with the wolf introduction? Well, Dan Tires, a uh, Forest Service biologist, started running moose transects in 1980. And he ran them all the way through. The moose population peaked out in 88. The large number of fires in uh, Yellowstone 88 destroyed a lot of moose habitat and the population started dropping fairly dramatically. Uh, that was 1988. 1995, we brought in wolves. Wolves have killed very few moose. They're a more formidable um, creature, but they did take some. And so from down to uh, probably about 2,000, the population continued to drop. Then it leveled out for four or five years in there, somewhere in there. And we think now that it's starting to go back up. We're seeing a lot of recovery of moose habitat. And um, yeah, my impression too is in recent years, it's gone up. Dan, uh, who got his PhD with the moose studies is still working on it. I haven't talked to him recently, but last time I did, he was optimistic that he was seeing an upturn in the moose also. So hopefully that's what we're getting. Uh, one of the things that worries me though, as the park now is getting warmer, Moose don't like the warmer climate, so I'm hoping they can hold on. Yeah. Well, uh, moving on, um, what uh, what challenges do wolves face in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, both from other predators and from hunters and all of the above? In the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, Yellowstone National Park is 3,400 square miles whereas the whole ecosystem itself is about 23,000 square miles. Wow. There's two dramatically different populations of wolves. Those in the park, which most people see here, uh, become fans of, and those outside the park. In the park, the wolf actually is still an endangered species, well-protected, and does well. When they go outside the park, uh, they are no longer endangered, and federal legislation has passed onto the states which have hunting of the wolves. And I do support hunting. We have to control wolf populations and hunting is our only way to do it. We can't have wolves everywhere. We can't have them in Bozeman and in Minneapolis because, and I use those two examples because they have come into the suburbs. But as soon as a wolf bites someone in a town, we've got a major problem. And I'm as great a wolf conservationist there is, but I recognize that that's real bad for the wolf. Um, and everybody drives through the West has a gun in the back and they do what we call the triple S syndrome, shoot, shovel, shut up. And if we have somebody bit, that impact is going to hit the wolves all over. When we argued for wolf reintroduction, we agreed that there would be a level of wolves and that that we would call reincovered and we would need to keep wolves at that population. Well, we're definitely past that line now and we need to control them so the best way to do it is hunting it bothers me though that we have a wolf in yellowstone who we've studied for seven years radio collared really no and he wanders outside the park and gets shot so i do support the idea that we have some sort of a buffer around yellowstone to try to protect our study animals and maybe the buffer can only be reduced number of harvest uh, it'd be nice if it was no harvest, but at least a reduced harvest in the hunting zones around the park would be great to help protect them. But across the West, the wolves have 
uh, dramatically increased. There's no question biologically that the wolves are a great, great success story, the greatest success story of a wildlife experiment, the reintroduction of wolves in the 20th century. Uh, so biologically, they're good. Uh, politically, they're still both sides to the question and they don't see eye to eye by any means. Um, and it's gonna be a long time before uh, they um, come together, not years, but generations of people that see how wolves should be managed and can successfully be managed. Yeah, I know that uh, there have been wolf sightings in uh, Oregon, both in uh, northeastern Oregon, where we used to live, and uh, in southwestern Oregon and uh, in uh, northern California. So uh, it's uh, interesting how far they've spread. Well, we have well-established populations in Oregon. It's not simply a sighting. We have breeding wolf packs there. And um, we haven't, as far as I'm aware, had a breeding pack yet in California. And we've got breeding packs in Washington. So yes, the animals have successfully moved west. The population is doing great for us wolf lovers. So same question, I guess, about the black bears and the grizzly bears. Uh... What challenges do they face uh, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Well, the grizzly bear, you know, we had a population low in the mid-1970s, around 140 maybe. People like to debate that number. We won't do that here. And the population has been steadily increasing to now it's over 700 grizzlies in the ecosystem. Uh, again, having supported the efforts to list the grizzly and recover the grizzly. I'm greatly for that. We have definitely reached our goals of grizzly recovery. And we're now at the point of questioning the delisting. We have worries about the grizzly. Many of its uh, food resources have been diminishing in the last uh, two decades, particularly the last 10 years. Things like cutthroat trout, white bark pine. And um, that is a very, big worry as to the future of the grizzly, not in 10 years, but in 25, 50, and 100 years. I have quite a great faith in the grizzly bear, its ability to adapt, but what scares me more is how well we can protect the habitat so the bear may be able to adapt in it. We're selling more land, subdividing more land, more reasons for encounters, food supplies of some sorts are dropping down. Uh, I do support delisting. The states should have uh, control over the animals of their state. But uh, my answer is delist, but don't trust. We of the conservation community need to keep a tight eye, close eye on the states and a tight eye on the management of these animals. So right now, the grizzly bear was delisted. It's now by court order been relisted. And I believe Nothing else has happened. I've been spent the last six weeks in the Arctic, so I might be behind on some point. But I think it's now relisted. And um, this battle will go on for the next decade on the bear, grizzly bear. Uh, ultimately, I do believe it will probably be delisted. Now, black bears, well, we got a grizzlies are lucky. They got a big fan club. We don't have a big black bear fan club. So we don't have as much knowledge studies on the black bear. But from all of our uh, insights, we'd say black bears in the ecosystem are probably doing pretty good and not something that we have to uh, worry about with either management in the national parks, Yellowstone, Grand Teton, or by the states. I think state management uh, is doing well with the black bears. Yeah, I actually uh, see more black bears in uh, Yellowstone and the Lamar Valley than I do grizzly bears. So. Uh... They, they seem to be doing all right, and they certainly attract a lot of people. There's uh, the bear jams in the uh, Lamar Valley area seem to be black bear jams much more often than grizzly bear jams, in my experience anyway. Well, there's a very interesting aspect to that, Kirby. Most of the black bear jams occur in the Roosevelt to Tower area uh, over the Yellowstone picnic area. And those are family lines that we can follow for many years back. 
uh, way back in the 30s, uh, it became common that the female with cubs around the Roosevelt area became known as Rosie. And every year there's a Rosie. She's a female with little cubs. And I got people that swear uh, they've seen Rosie with her cubs of the year every year for the last 20 years. Well, it's not the same Rosie because the black bears have a cycle of two to three years um, where they take care of cubs the year yearlings and then kick them out. So same female is not the same one being same seen, but there's always Rosie. Well, anyway, if you go back to Ernest Thompson's seat in 1897, he wanted to study bears in Yellowstone. He came and he camped uh, right at Roosevelt and he saw no bears. He came back again in um, 1904, I think it was, and no bears. Partway through the season, he visited with the superintendent of the park and the superintendent of the park says, well, if you go over to the hotel by Ojo Caliente Springs and study your bears there. And he went over there and it was black bears all over. I think um, that where we see bears is a product of family lines that are established and exist for several years or decades. Back in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, our hot spot for grizzly bears was Antelope Creek. And then all uh, that has gradually shifted over to Lamar Valley. We used to have family lines in Antelope. Now the family lines are in Lamar Valley. So where the bears happen to be, I think is a large part of their genealogy and ecological establishment. Hmm. Interesting. Wasn't aware of all of that. You want to uh, talk a bit about how climate change was affecting wolves and bears and uh, wildlife in general in Yellowstone? Well, I think I've kind of touched on that. I teach a climate change here class here in Yellowstone, and we are definitely seeing all sorts of examples of it. The ice melting out earlier on Yellowstone Lake, um, a increase in precipitation, a step change in the year 2000 on uh, how much snow we get and how much warmer the snow pack is now through the winter. Um, many examples that we could go through and they're definitely starting to affect the animals. When we start thinking of animals affected though, possibly one that is more at the tip of being affected is the pica. Big animals like wolves and grizzlies have more ability to compensate for the climate change. The little pica, which is a member of the rabbit order, uh, doesn't hibernate, lives under the snow, has to have snow and cold in high rocky mountains, is going to feel and show the impact more because the snow is melting off earlier up there. Plants are blooming earlier, which is not synchronized with the uh, birth process of the pica. So the pica, when they're young, need food. It's already past the peak season. And we're seeing the little guys maybe showing the impact quicker than the large guys. But in the long run, grizzly bears, for example, uh, white bark pine is a food that the grizzly relishes. It helps them fatten up in the fall for hibernation. Well, it's at the southern limit of its distribution here in uh, Montana, Wyoming. Just a few get into Colorado. And the white bark pine needs cold environments. Well, the environment is uh, warming up. And our models we use in climate change predict that by 2050, which is not that far off anymore, that most of the white bark pine will be gone here. The white bark pine has also suffered from fire, from beetles, uh, from white, uh, from blister rust. And uh, so we're losing the bark, white bark pine. Well, not only is the grizzly bear count on the white bark pine, but some estimates go as many as 60 different animals eat the white bark pine nuts or count on them. So there's no question that climate change is affecting the plants and the animals of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. It's interesting to me, I, uh, I travel around the West and uh, I'm uh, involved in a number of organizations and I, I saw a report from uh, Southwest, well, South Central Oregon, I guess, about pica. And uh, apparently, if I understood it correctly, there's uh, a population of pica that uh, somehow managed <coughs> to survive at lower elevations than those uh, found in Yellowstone, for instance. Uh, is that a subspecies or a race or something different than what's in Yellowstone? 
Not familiar with the Oregon example you're using, but in California, there's a population down at 2,000 feet in the mine tailings and Rocky Mountains of an old mine area. So some pika definitely have adapted to lower elevations with warmer temperatures, but that's certainly not most of our animals who are high mountain animals. And, you know, I'd suggest that ability to adapt is there, but the question is, will the others be able to adapt or might their ecosystems disappear faster than they can do that adaptation? And we kind of worry right now in what we see changing around the pika that they won't be able to adapt fast enough to the climate change. Right, I guess that's always the question. Uh, another question uh, out of total ignorance, I guess, uh, talking about the white bark pine, is it possible to uh, breed species of uh, white bark pine that uh, will survive at lower elevations and thus, uh, you know, plant new, new trees? Is that an option? Well, the white bark pine is a long-lived pine. It takes long, long time to uh, reach maturity where it is producing cones. And so breeding experiments, uh, that lifespan is beyond what most people would be willing to try to breed to select for some that could exist at a warmer uh, climate regime at a lower elevation. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody working on that right now. Um, white bark pines, 500, even 1,000 years old, are not uncommon. Oh, wow. Uh, the best hope is the uh, Clark's Nutcracker each year buries the seeds uh, for their winter food supply, but when they don't use them all, those seeds sprout. And then perhaps that the Clark's Nutcracker will keep spreading enough for the trees to grow but experimentation, that would be a major financial task. And I, I'm not aware of anybody trying to breed those at the moment. Ah, okay. Just curious. Do you want to talk about your most recent trip to the Arctic? Our high Arctic adventures this year were great. First trip, we were trying to get across the Northwest Passage after leaving Greenland. And uh, the pack ice, which has to form each winter and melt out in the summer, forms large rafts of ice and the wind could move it around. And the route we were trying to get through was a narrow passage and the rafts of ice had jammed it full. And so there were half a dozen ships trying to get through this passage, which is about, oh, 20 miles long, uh, maybe a mile wide, full of ice six to 12 feet thick. And the first ship, a big cruise liner, trying to get around it, ran aground. A hundred plus people had to be evacuated off. So two Canadian icebreakers came in to evacuate them. Another sailboat was tipped over by the ice. They managed to get it righted. But a second sailboat got into the passage. It was crushed and sank almost instantly. So two of the people from that, the two people from that, got out on the ice. A helicopter from the icebreaker picked them up. Well, we followed that icebreaker north through the pack ice and um, got north of the raft of ice. Those that were south were stuck south of it for well over a week, couldn't go anywhere. But we uh, headed out in a major epic of getting airplanes to get our people out. It took us an extra two days past the scheduled end of our trip to get everybody home. So that one was exciting, plus lots of incredible photography. Uh, the living in Greenland trip was photographer's dream. Uh, we got some good aurora, but the ice, uh, this is the largest iceberg factory in the Northern Hemisphere, the biggest and most productive in icebergs. And we go out on small boats around them. We go to the front of calving ice, uh, calving glaciers. We helicopter up on the ice cap of Greenland. So this was the photographer's dream of ice photography. And, uh, that trip's not particularly wildlife. On the first trip, we saw a lot, lot of wildlife, but this year, it was kind of distant sightings of polar bears and narwhal and uh, humpback whales. Got more humpback whales on our Greenland trip. So we had great time, great photography out of it. The color in the Arctic is just incredible. The sun doesn't set by going straight down. The sun goes around in big Arctic switch arcs, which give you 
long, extended, beautiful twilight. And then, of course, at night, since there aren't many city lights, night photography and aurora are great. Yeah, I would think so. Well, it sounds like that uh, Arctic expedition sounded or ended up being a lot more exciting than anybody planned on, huh? Definitely exciting. People don't realize that going to the Arctic, there's still danger involved. You may be on a big cruise ship, although our cruise ship is a class 1B icebreaker. Those waters are uncharted. The ice dictates what you do. And uh, this year, we weren't able to get through the Northwest Passage. I've been going through the Northwest Passage for since 2009, and the ice is melting out more and more each year. But, you know, all it takes is uh, the wind to put that ice in the wrong spot, and then you don't do it. The Arctic tells you what's what, and it's still an explorer's place. You never know, but there's so many great places we go ashore, say on Baffin Island, Devon Island, Ellesmere Island, Greenland, and uh, oh, glaciers and landscapes and muskox. Things are just really once in a lifetime adventures to photograph. Yeah, I guess so. So uh, to to wrap things up, uh, talk a bit about how the polar bears are doing with the with climate change and the changes in the Arctic ice pack and, and that sort of thing. Well, that's a sad topic. Um, yes. <laughs> I started running uh, polar bear programs 29 seasons ago. This will be my 29th one. And back then with my class I'd take up, uh, we'd get 150 polar bears in a week. Last year, I took up two classes the first class, we got 18. The second class, we got 12. And I worked the people hard. They had to dig out snow drifts so we could get through with our vehicles to go look from can't see to can't see. And that last trip, we got 12 separate bears. The trend has been continuously downhill since I started going up there. There's 19 polar bear regions around, circumpolar around the North Pole. And in Oh, a third of them, we know the population's going down, and a couple, it may be going up. Over half of those populations, though, are in Russia. Russia has most of the Arctic Circle, and there's no research in them, so we don't know for sure what's going on there. But there is no question the population's dropping. The sea ice is a key element. They have to be out on the sea ice to hunt seals, and it's melting out earlier, freezing up later, so a shorter season. And when they have to go ashore, uh, particularly the females earlier, uh, they don't have as much fat. They can't convert fat to milk. And the cubs of the year, the survivorship is dropping dramatically. The sea ice is melting so fast. There's two kinds, annual sea ice and multiple year sea ice. The annual sea ice over the North Pole in as little as 10 years will melt out. There will be people taking their own sailboat within your lifetime, Kirby, and my lifetime to the North Pole. The multi-year ice is actually not centered on the polar basin, but a little south. And it'll take a lot longer for that to melt out, maybe 2050, but it's going. I would guess we could lose 75% of the world population of polar bears by 2050, certainly 2100. I hope those bears are adaptive enough that they can uh, survive that effect of climate change. I got to share one climate change thing. We deal firsthand with many Inuit on our program. Uh, they come and speak with us. We have Inuit that travel with us for two or three weeks at a time. And the response is almost universal. They look at us and they say, well, you folks, you come from the civilized world. You have all the conveniences. You have great cameras, uh, great iPhones. You have incredible news. We just don't understand how you can question the fact of climate change and what it's doing to us. It's destroying our lives. How can you not see that? Well, yeah, I guess they have a ring seat for that, don't they? They sure do. You might call it a ringed seal seat, though. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, we better wrap things up uh, before we do. Uh, tell, tell everyone where they can find you and your books and your classes and tours. Well, thank you, Kirby. Uh, simply visit our website, which is called track 
nature.com, all one word, or Google Halfpenny. And I'm not hard to find once you get into Google Halfpenny. And we do have lots of activities and books out there on the market. And we, our organization supports educational classes and research programs here at the North End of Yellowstone. Great. Uh, and I'll put information about that in the show notes so people can uh, find it easier. So thanks, Jim, for being on Photographing the West. Uh, it's been great fun talking to you. This podcast is published on the 15th and 30th of each month and can be found on my website at www.flanagan, F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N, photos, F-O-T-O-S, all one word, dot com, on iTunes, SoundCloud, and many other RSS feeds. Thanks for tuning in and talk to you next month. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to Photographing the West podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and leave us a review. Till next time, here's wishing you safe travels and good light. Mm-hmm.